أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا غريب يا شهيد كربلاء فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد <تصفيق> As we come to the conclusion and the final passages of the first ziyarah of Al-Imam Abi Abdullah al Hussein salawatullahi alayhi, we come to amazing passages that highlight the importance of the Imam and the importance of Ahl al-Bayt. In these passages, we are told about the great status of the one whom we are visiting when you go and visit your imam know the status of your imam that allows you to better connect with your imam it allows you to humble yourself to your imam peace be upon him we see that in this passage and this passage truly represents the peak of the ziyarah the pinnacle of this first ziyarah and all the ideas that are contained in it, it all lies in the following passages. And Imam al-Sadiq says, Man arad Allah bada'a bikum. The one who wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with you. Bikum fatah Allah wa bikum yakhtim. Through you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started, commenced everything. Through you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened the chapter of the universe. And through you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will conclude everything. Indeed, these are powerful passages which shed light on the role of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, in the creation of the universe. Now I want you to open your hearts for what the Imam السلام, is communicating for us. Because the Imam says not everyone is able to bear our teachings, to handle the depth of our reality. It requires that we open our hearts so we can handle the amazing position of Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them. Man arad Allah bada'a bikum. The one who wants Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts with you, O Ahl al Bayt, because the Ahl al Bayt, peace be upon them, are essentially the origin of the universe. We have countless narrations that tell us the universe was created from the light of Ahl al Bayt, peace be upon them. Here, for example, you have a Sunni scholar by the name of Abdul Qadir Hamzawi. In his book, Al-Manaqib Al-Fakhira, he narrates a hadith from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. In this narration, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, one day I went to the Prophet I told him, O Prophet of God, 
Show me the truth so I can follow it. The Prophet peace be upon him told me, do you see that room, that small room there? Go into it, see what's in there and come back to me. Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, I went into that room. I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib peace be upon him in his ruku' and his sujood, he was praying. And then Ali ibn Abi Talib, after his salah, he made this dua. He said, O oh Allah, بحرمتي عبدك ورسولك محمد أو الله by the sanctity of your servant and your messenger محمد صلى الله عليه وآله forgive the sinners from my Shia he says I saw the scene and the Imam making this dua I went back to the Prophet to inform him what I saw he says, I went to see the Prophet. I saw the Prophet also in ruku and sujood praying. And when the Prophet finished his salah, he made a dua. He says, Oh Allah, bihaqqi abdika Ali ibn Abi Talib, by the sanctity of your slave Ali ibn Abi Talib, forgive the sinners of my ummah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, I was flabbergasted. What's going on? He says, I was so shocked, I fell to the ground unconscious from seeing these two scenes. He says, the Prophet carried my head. After I regained my consciousness, the Prophet told me, Ibn Mas'ud, what's wrong with you? He told him, I can't handle this, what's going on? Ali ibn Abi Talib is asking Allah by your sanctity and you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by Ali ibn Abi Talib's sanctity. How does that work? The Prophet told him, Akufrun ba'da iman? Oh, Ibn Mas'ud, you have come to believe. Are you losing that iman? Does disbelief come after belief? Then he told him, Then explain me, how does this work? The Prophet told him, I want you to know that the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created was our lights. From the azama of His light, from the greatness, from the glory of his light, he created my light, the light of Ali, the light of Hassan and the light of Hussein. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took my light, he split my light. From my light he created the heavens and the earth and I am better than the heavens and the earth. Then he took the light of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and he created the arsh and the kursi, the throne and the chair. You know Ayatul Kursi in the Quran, the Kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Ali ibn Abi Talib is better than the Arsh and the Kursi. Then he took the light of Al Hasan and he created from it, he split the light, from it he created Al Lawhi Wal Qalam, the tablet, Fi Lawhan Mahfuz, where the Quran is preserved, the essence of the Quran and the pen. And Al Hasan is better than the tablet and the pen. Then he took the light of Hussein, he split that light and from that light he created the paradise and the Hur al Ain. And Al Hussein is better than paradise and the Hur al Ain. But then there was no light in the universe because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all these lights he created the universe. The universe was dark. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a light that illuminated the entire universe and that light was the light of Fatima to Zahra Salamullahi Alayha. When the Prophet is saying that our essence is light, the Prophet is not referring to a physical light. When you think of the origin of the universe and the origin of Ahlul Bayt, do not conceive these terms in a materialistic way, in a physical way. The light is, in, is, is a type of essence. It's a type of creation beyond our comprehension. It's the purest thing in existence. Allah Allah is the light of the universe. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something physical. The purest thing in existence is light. And when you ever think of Ayat al-Tathir, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Allah has willed to purify the Ahlul Bayt. 
a thorough purification. We cannot come to understand the essence of this purification unless we realize that their essence is light. Because in the universe, there's nothing purer than light. Even the souls are not as pure as the light. Because the souls have constraints. The souls, they have, you know, this worldly dimension to them. This physical dimension to them. Which makes them lower than the light. And the purest thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created is the light. And that is the light of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Now this idea that the first creation of God is light, you find, for example, similar philosophical ideas. In Platonic philosophy, in the philosophy of Plato, he had a similar idea, which is an adaptation of this teaching, which was taught by all prophets of God. What does Plato say? He says, for example, that God, the first thing he created was the intellect. The intellect is a reflection of God's greatness. And then some, philosoph some philosophers came and say, well, the first intellect created the second intellect, and then the second intellect created the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, until the tenth. You know, each philosopher comes and they add their own two cents. So you get sometimes, you know, some interesting theories out there. But then the tenth intellect or whichever intellect created this universe. These philosophers advocated that God did not directly create us and the universe. Why? Couldn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us directly? Why was it that He created the intellect first and through the intellect the universe was created? Or through that light of Ahlul Bayt, as the Prophet describes, the universe was created. Why? They say that the material world, this physical universe that we see, does not have the capacity to be directly created by the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's limited. To give you an example, let's say you have a small light bulb. If you connect the small light bulb to a 5000 volt generator, what will happen? What will happen if you connect a small light bulb, which, light bulb which only needs 10 volts, 5 volts, you connect it to a 5,000 volt generator giving you that much power. What happens? Blows up. It cannot handle that greatness. It cannot handle that power. We the creation of God are so weak that these philosophers explain we could not handle Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating us directly. Therefore, you need an adapter, right? When you plug something in the wall, you're getting 110 volts, but not every appliance is able to handle 110 volts. You need adapters that take that big power, they make it smaller, and they give it to you. And this was the role of the intellect, or this was the role of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Think of them as adapters, intermediaries between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we did not have the capacity to have been created directly. This is a fundamental point. And we see that in Platonic philosophy, this also exists. Now I believe that Plato and other philosophers, they took these ideas from prophets and then they added to them, they modified them. It's an adaptation to what the prophets used to teach. And when you want to know the greatness of Ahlul Bayt in terms of them sacrificing for us, there's, an, there's a fundamental point that I want you to understand here. Because we all know that the Ahlul Bayt sacrifice for God. They're humble, right? They're humble. You will not find a family in history more humble than them. Despite their great status, they humbled themselves. They went through so much difficulty. They served the people. They had to handle so much pain from their societies. That's all humbleness and sacrifice. You see humbleness and sacrifice on the day of Ashura. And while in this worldly life, we come to see the sacrifice and the humbleness of Ahlul Bayt, that's only a fraction of their sacrifice and humbleness. These philosophers, you know what they say? They tell you that the greatest sacrifice 
for the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Please understand this fundamental point to appreciate how much they've sacrificed for us. They tell us that the epitome of their sacrifice lies in this amazing fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them as pure lights. Now because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us human beings who are a very low creation, a very weak creation, to also ascend and achieve completion and achieve purity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed these pure lights of Ahlul Bayt to descend and descend and descend into our materialistic world so they can lift us. And for them, that was the biggest sacrifice. For them to come down from that pure state of being light and to be with us on earth guiding us. That's their biggest sacrifice. And that was their greatest difficulty. In one hadith, Imam al-Baqir salamullah alayhi, He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us lights, then He had these lights settle in souls. That's one descent. Because the position of lights is higher than the position of souls. Then He took these souls and He entrapped the, them in the body. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the soul settle in the body. We see there are two descents that the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, had to go through had to sacrifice so that they could lift the human being because the human being does not have the capacity to go to the world of lights or the world of souls so they had to come down to take us to give us the opportunity to achieve completion and that was their biggest sacrifice and that's how you come to know the great tragedy that occurred to them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought these pure lights he caused them to descend to descend so they can be with us to guide us and how did humanity treat them this is the great tragedy brothers and sisters this is the tragedy of Ahlul Bayt yes what happened in this worldly life the oppression that they were subject to the injustice that they experienced this is all part of their sacrifice but that's a fraction of their sacrifice the real sacrifice what that was that they were willing to move down from the world of pure lights to our own world just so that they can guide us. And that's how we come to appreciate the Imams of Ahlul Bayt and this ziyara and these passages is bringing our attention to this reality that when you visit Abu Abdullah Hussein salam, realize what he did for you. Realize what he offered for humanity. And when you know that he is the origin of the universe, now it makes sense why the entire universe reacted to his martyrdom. Didn't we describe on the third night, on the fourth night, how the blood of Imam al Hussein salam, shook the entire universe? It generated a shockwave in the universe because the Ahlul Bayt are the origin of the universe. When the origin is hit, what happens? When you hit the origin, everything is impacted. Because the Imam salam, lies at the center of this universe. It's like a body which has a center, either the brain or the heart. When you have a heart attack, when you have a stroke in the brain, what happens? The entire body is paralyzed. It generates a shockwave in the body. Everything is impacted. And Imam al Hussein salam and the pure lights of Ahlul Bayt represent that epicenter of creation, that center of the universe. And we should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us and delivering to us that gift. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts for guidance and we thank him for introducing us to the wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them because there's nothing more valuable in the universe than their wilaya nothing more valuable and millions and billions of people have been denied this opportunity 
Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thank Him for blessing you brothers and sisters with families who introduced you to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. You know, the poet says in Arabic, لا عذب الله أمي إنها شربت حب الوصي وغذتنيه باللبني May Allah never punish my mother for she drank the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen and she fed it to me through breastfeeding. وَكَانَ لِي وَالِدٌ يَهْوَى أَبَا حَسَنٍ فَصِرْتُ مِنْ ذِي وَذَا أَهْوَى أَبَا الْحَسَنِ And I had a father who yearned for Aba al-Hasan, al-Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And therefore with such a father, with such a mother, I came to find the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Honor your families. Honor your parents, your grandparents who sacrificed through the generations so they can keep these ideas alive for you so they can protect your for, your faith for you you see today in our societies many of our youth they run away from their families from their parents from their grandparents we need to honor these individuals why is it that in our lives there is no room for our parents and grandparents you know here in the west the average teenager in north america speaks to his grandparents four hours a year. Four hours. You spend hundreds of hours a year watching movies and entertainment and everything, but your grandparents average of four hours. Throughout the entire year, that's how much you talk to them. Isn't this a disaster? These are blessings. These are people whom have experience. Unfortunately, you see our youth, day after day, they're moving away from their grandparents. Why? Back then, you know, everyone used to live in one village, in one community, even in one house. You had your parents, you had your grandparents, they were all a blessing. Now, everyone wants to run away. We've all become selfish. I want my own private life. I don't want to see my grandparents. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Maybe on Eid, I'll pick up the phone, Salamu Alaikum, and that's it. Why? These people are blessings Allah has given you. Your grandfather is a man of experience. He has wisdom. He's gone through so much. There's so much you can learn from him. Your, your grandmother is a mother who's seen so many different problems. She's navigated through all these problems in her life. She's got so much to share with you. Why is it that we run away from them? They are a blessing in our life. Be close to them. You know, for me, one of the most important factors in my upbringing when I was in Los Angeles was the presence of my grandfather. His presence was a blessing for all of us. I grew up in his house. And I never forget that day when he came back from the hospital, he had an open heart surgery. And you know, a man at that age was around 70 at the time, 70 or so. When he did that surgery and he came back from the hospital because he needed help in getting up from bed, you know, and going to do wudu or using the restroom or wanting something, I went from my room to his room on that night to sleep in his room just in case he wanted anything, I would be there for him. I remember it was around 4, 4.30 a.m. When I felt my grandfather wanting to get up, he did not want to wake me up. He probably saw me sleeping, he didn't want to disturb me. I felt as if he was getting up. So I woke up from my sleep and I saw him trying to get up from his bed. I told him, my grandfather, it's 4, 4 a.m., where, where are you going? He says, you just go sleep, I don't need anything. He went to the restroom, he did his wudu, he came back with all the pain, with all the, the doctor even told him, don't get up, don't do anything. He stood and he prayed Salat al -Layl. I'll never forget that image. At the age of 70, coming back from a hospital, so much pain, you just had your chest open for God's sake. But he did not abandon Salat al -Layl. Where do you get such blessings? Other than from your grandparents. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us with these amazing individuals, let's get closer to them. For it is they that they carried the wilayah of Ahlul Bayt and they gave it to us.
Hence, we see that the origin of the universe starts with the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Now this, this takes us to a second very important point. If the universe originates from the pure lights of the Ahlul Bayt, then it comes as a, as, as a no surprise that the entire universe is created for their sake. You know, we have many ahadith, many ziyaras, many supplications which tell us that the universe was created for the sake of Ahlul Bayt. How many of you have read Hadith Al Kisa? And you come to this passage, Inni ma khalaqtu sama an mabniya, wala ardan madhiya, wala qamaran muniran, wala shamsan mudi'an, wala, wala, wala. I've not created the universe, nor the skies, nor the earth, nor the moon, nor the sun, except for what purpose? Except for the sake of you, O Ahlul Bayt, and the love of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. We've heard this, but how can we come to conceive this? How do we comprehend that the universe was created for them? I'll share with you two points. Number one, the most valuable creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? The Milky Way galaxy? The black holes, what is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these materialistic beings, that's nothing compared to His greatness, compared to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually created. The first hadith in the book of Kafi sheds light on the best and most valuable creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is it? It says that the most valuable creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the intellect. That's the most valuable creation because the intellect gives meaning to the universe. Without it, what's the purpose of this universe? You know, imagine if you're driving in the middle of the desert or in the middle of the forest and then you see this huge wonderful city with skyscrapers, with beautiful neighborhoods, but it's empty. No one lives in it. No one makes use of it. No one even passes by to appreciate its beauty and splendor. What would you say? You would say, who created this city? You know, this person is insane. He just wasted his efforts. He created a city where nothing in it exists to benefit from it, to perceive it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create this vast universe in vain. What gives meaning to the universe is the intellect because through the intellect you come to grasp the essence of Allah's mercy, the essence of Allah's greatness. It is, the mer it is the intellect that is the tool that allows you to perceive the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The intellect is the tool that allows you to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, why would God create galaxies and stars in the universe? For what purpose? It's the intellect that gives meaning to life. Now I ask you, if the intellect is the one that gives meaning to life, is it absurd to say that the entire universe is created for the intellect? That's the purpose. And it's the most beloved creation of Allah. As Allah says in one hadith Qudsi. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ خَلْقًا أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْكَ That's my most beloved creation. My most prized and cherished creation. Now let me ask you this fundamental question. Who embodies the full intellect that Allah has created? Who were those who were endowed with the full intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created? Those are Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Don't ever think it's an exaggeration to say that the entire universe was created for their sake. They represent the full intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And therefore the entire universe is created for their sake and for their honor because they hold that full intellect. And as we established, without the intellect there is no meaning for the universe. That's one way of understanding the greatness of Ahlul Bayt and how the universe was created for them. Number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as He tells us in the Quran, why did He create us? Us, the jinn, the creation, why did He create us? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْإِنسَ وَالْجِنَّ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah is unequivocally 
clearly telling us that he did not create the ants, the jinn, the human being, this whole creation for that matter, except for worship and ibadah. Because it is only through worship that we can realize our full potential and we can purify ourselves. Now since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created humanity for the purpose of ibadah, I ask you, who were the best worshippers of Allah in the history of humankind? Who worshipped Allah the best in the most complete manner possible? In one hadith, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq salamullah alayhi. He says, it is because of us that Allah created all of the creations. Because before us, there was no tasbih, there was no worshipping. We were the first to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through us, the creation came to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through us, you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through us, the angels learned how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they saw our lights, pure lights, doing tasbih, they learned the tasbih from us. The Ahlul Bayt are the most complete worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the universe is created for them. That's why we have countless narrations in Shia and Sunni books that tell us if it weren't for the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether the Prophet during his lifetime, or Ilwam al-Mahdi in our lifetime, if it weren't for that hujjah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would annihilate this earth and the universe. Why? Because if you take the hujjah out, you take the full intellect out. And you take the full worshipper out. What's the purpose of having the universe? The presence of Imam al-Mahdi validates the existence of the universe. Because Imam al-Mahdi represents the being who fully worships the Almighty God. In every act that he does, he is worshiping God 100%. That's why, for example, in Ziyarat Ali Yaseen, the Imam brings our attention to this very important reality. As-salamu alayka hina taqoom. As-salamu alayka hina taqoom. Peace be upon you when you stand. Peace be upon you when you sit. And salamu alayka hina taqnut wa tusalli hina tuhallil wa tukabbir. Peace be upon you when you pray, when you do qunut, when you say la ilaha illallah. Why? Because the Imam is telling us essentially every move of Imam al-Mahdi is a full act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the only the Ahl al-Bayt, peace be upon them, who truly know how to worship the Almighty God because of that full knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. Let's appreciate the amazing status of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. It is not an exaggeration to say that the entire universe was created for them, for their sake and in their honor. This is a reality that has been established in the ahadith of Al Muhammad وآلي محمد صلى الله عليهم Now this brings us to the third point which these passages in the ziyara point out to us. Given that the Ahl al-Bayt are the origins of the universe and given that the universe was created for their sake then the consequence of that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed them with the legislative and the physical natural authority. Now if someone is the origin of the universe and the universe was created for their sake, don't come and tell me they have no authority, no control over this universe with the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you are the cause, your light, through your light the universe was created and the universe was created in your honor for you. Are you telling me that these beings have no authority and control over the universe? With the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them these two types of authority. Al-Wulayat Taqwiniya is the physical, natural authority. 
where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted them with running the affairs of the universe. Now you see every belief that we have is well grounded in the Holy Quran. And you always have a right. Whenever you hear something that is new to you, that may sound strange, always ask any scholar or any speaker whom you hear from, give me proof from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I tell you, we the followers of Ahlul Bayt, there is not one aspect of our belief system that is not grounded in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask me for the proof. How is it that the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, they have the physical authority or they are entrusted with running the affairs of the universe? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us one small example of a man whom had the Quran not mentioned, we did not even know he had existed. A man by the name of Asif ibn Barkhiya. He was the assistant of which Prophet? Of Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. What does the Quran tell us? قَالَ الَّذِي عِنْدَهُ عِلْمٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ The one who had some knowledge of the book, he told Sulaiman, Oh Sulaiman, I can get you the throne of Bilqis, Bathsheba, all the way from Yemen to Palestine, within a blink of an eye. Because he had some knowledge of the book. You see this wilayat taqwiniya that he had? This natural physical authority. How could you transport a huge throne from over a thousand kilometers away within a blink of an eye? How is that possible? It's the authority given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he had some knowledge of the book. The amount of knowledge you have determines how much authority Allah gives you in this universe. Another verse in the Holy Quran which demonstrates this pivotal point. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Prophet Sulaiman and Dawood. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُودَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا And we have given knowledge to Dawood and Sulaiman. وَقَالَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They said, Oh Allah, all praise is due to you for favoring us and giving us preference over many of your believing servants. وَوَرِثَدُ سُلَيْمَانُ دَاوُود Sulaiman inherited his father Dawood. وَقَالَ أَيَّا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ عُلِّمْنَا مَنْطِقَ الطَّيْرِ وَأُوتِينَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ O people, we have been given the knowledge of knowing what the birds speak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us everything. How much Allah gives authority to any being is a direct result of how much knowledge that person has. The more knowledge one being has been given, the more authority that person is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who is the one who has the full knowledge of the book? قُلْ كَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَكُمْ وَمَنْ عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ Look at the tafasir of all the Muslimin. The one who had ilmu al-kitab, the full knowledge of the book is Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. If one being, the successor of who? Of Sulaiman alayhi salam, has some knowledge of the book and he has wilayat taqwiniya. Are you telling me that the successor of the greatest prophet, who's greater than Prophet Sulaiman, Prophet Muhammad is greater than Prophet Sulaiman, if his successor has the full knowledge of the book, don't tell me he has no wilayat taqwiniya. This is the basis in the Quran, the wilayat that Allah gives is proportionate to the knowledge that one has. And there's no one in history who had more knowledge than the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. They inherited the knowledge from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Therefore they had that wilayat taqwiniya. And hence Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designated them as intermediaries who run the affairs of the universe. Is there further evidence in the Quran because some come out and say, you know what, this is shirk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He could do everything. Why does He need the Ahlul Bayt to run the affairs of the universe? 
First of all, the Quran tells us of beings who run the affairs of the universe. Who are they? The angels. The Holy Quran is full of verses telling us about angels who execute the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They run the affairs. Let me ask you the simple question. Can God take your soul when you die? Does God have the power to take your soul? Yes. But who takes your soul? Why? Is Allah weak? Does He have no power for Him to need the angel of death to take your soul? The Quran is clear that Malakul Maut, the angel of death, is the one who takes your life. For example, when you go to Surah Al Naza'at, Wal Naza'at Gharqa, Wal Nashitati Nashta, until this verse, Wal Mudabbirati Amra, the angels have been entrusted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to manage the affairs of the universe. Look at the hadith and the verses. You have angels in charge of carrying the winds and the rain. You have angels in charge of the oceans, the mountains, the universe, everything, the thunder and the lightning. This is all in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala need these angels? No, He does not. Allah is the all-powerful. But why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned the angels to run some affairs of the universe? Number one, to show the status of those angels, to appreciate their status. And that applies to the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. When you see God is entrusting a being to carry a task, you come to respect that being. That God has found that being worthy to delegate these tasks to him. That's number one. Number two, it shows the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is the king of the universe. Now how do you demonstrate that you're the king when you have billions and trillions of worker un workers under you? That shows the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you realize that there are millions of angels working for one creator, that demonstrates to you the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the power of Allah. If one of his angels, and that's Israel, can take your life. What about the one who created Israel? How much power does he have? This serves to demonstrate to us the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endowed the Ahlul Bayt with this very powerful position. They are intermediaries who run the affairs of the universe. And this is what we find in the ziyarah of the Imam alayhi salam, which we established on the first night is the most authentic ziyarah as a Shaykh al-Saduq witnesses in his book. What does this passage say? Bikum tum bitul ardu ashjaraha. وَبِكُمْ تُخْرِجُ الْأَرْضُ ثِمَارَهَا وَبِكُمْ تُنْزِلُ السَّمَاءُ قَطْرَهَا O oh, Ahlul Bayt, through you the trees grow on the earth. Through you they produce the fruits. Through you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the rain. It's all through the blessings of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Because they are the intermediaries between us and the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the greatness of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And this is well grounded in the Holy Quran. There's no shirk about this. If this is shirk, then the malaika is also shirk. Then the angel of death taking your life is also shirk. Unacceptable. This is the teachings of the Holy Quran. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was higher than the angels. When you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating Adam, and instructing the angels who run the affairs of the universe do sujood to Adam. Are you telling me they're greater than Adam? And the Prophet is greater than Adam and has a greater role in this universe. But it's all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know in the Quran, when Allah speaks about Prophet Isa reviving the dead and curing the blind and the leper, bi'ithnillah, it's all with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not shirk. The Quran tells us about Prophet Jesus السلام, actually creating لكم, I create for you from clay, you know, a bird-like creature as the Quran tells us. But it's all with the permission of the Almighty God. This is their wilayat taqwiniyya. 
their physical, natural authority. And then they've also been given something more than that, brothers and sisters. And this is the pinnacle of the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein. This one passage here. This one passage here, I tell you, is probably, you know, the, the most poignant passage you will find about the status of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about His will being entrusted to the Ahlul Bayt, about the Wilaya Tashri'iyya, the legislative authority, what does the ziyarah of the Imam say? Iradatul Rabbi fi maqadiri umurihi. تَهْبِطُ إِلَيْكُمْ وَتَصْدُرُ مِنْ بُيُوتِكُمْ وَالصَّادِرُ عَمَّا فُصْلَ مِنْ أَحْكَامِ الْعِبَادِ Do you know what this passage means? Imam al-Sadiq salam in this authentic ziyarah of Imam al-Husayn, he is telling us how to address Imam al-Husayn. This is how you address the Ahlul Bayt. The will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iradatul Rabb, the will of the Lord, in the measures of his affairs descends upon you to your homes and then it is issued from your homes. You know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has wills, right? Allah every you know, moment he's willing for the universe to exist, to give that person a job, to sustain that person, to kill that person, to elevate this person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this ongoing irada. He has this will. You know where the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is issued from? The will of God descends to the homes of the Ahlul Bayt and then through them, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is executed. That's the status of Ahlul Bayt. That's why in one hadith, an Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says when Allah wants to will for anything, Allah has decreed something, He wants something done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends His will to the Prophet. The Prophet hands it to Imam Ali. Imam Ali to the Imam after him, after him, after him, until you get to Al Imam Al Mahdi. Then the Imam Al Mahdi, he approves the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it get, gets executed. And then when any action is to be raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when any action we offer, any deed, is to be raised to the Almighty God, that action is given and handed to the Imam of your time, then to the previous Imam, then to Amir al muminin then to the Prophet, then he submits it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because see, we also have a will. I also will. And Allah through His will has given me my own will. Allah has willed that I will. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ الله. But what I will, does it always please Allah? Not necessarily. Sometimes if, I, if it's an act of obedience, yes, it pleases God. If it's an act of disobedience, then no, it will not please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because why? Because of my lack of knowledge. The Ahlul Bayt have that full knowledge and God trusts them so much such that there is no difference between His will and their will. Because everything they will is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the Prophet says that the satisfaction of Fatima, Ridha Fatima Ridha Allah is the satisfaction of Allah. Don't tell me that Fatima is not infallible. Because if Allah says whenever she's satisfied, I'm satisfied. Whenever she's angry, I'm angry. That means Fatima can only become angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything she does and her entire will is the will of the Almighty God. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted them. That's why in another hadith we see the Imam alayhi salam says, Inna Allah khalatana God has mixed us with him. What does that mean? This is symbolic. The Imam says God has mixed our will with the will of Allah. We have one will. There are no two wills. The will of the Imam is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how much, how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trusts them. Because when you become fully obedient to Allah, then you also acquire that authority. Doesn't the hadith, which we all accept, says, Abdi, my servant, ata'ni, takun mithli, aw mathali. Obey me and you will become like me. You say to the thing, be, and it becomes. 
and the Ahlul Bayt fully obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them that authority where His will descends upon them and they issue the decrees on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam says, Allah God has mixed us with Himself because He has entrusted us so much. We represent God in everything and the Imam gives us a very powerful example from the Qur'an. There are so many verses in the Qur'an that speak about the anger of God, right? If you do this, Allah gets angry. فَلَمَّا آسَفُونَا انْتَقَمْنَا مِنْهُ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلِي مُحَمَّدْ Many verses speaks about emotions. How do we understand God gets angry? And Imam al-Sadiq says it's impossible for Allah to become angry. Because anger, anger is what? It's a reaction. You have to be physical. It's a state. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not physical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above, you know, having any state of having a reaction to be angry. Therefore, what does it mean when the Quran says Allah is angry, Allah is pleased? Or those people hurt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can Allah get hurt? Those who hurt Allah. What does that mean? Allah doesn't get hurt. Allah is not something physical for you to hurt Him. The Imam says, when Allah says that He becomes angry, it's us, the Ahlul Bayt, who become angry on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the greatness of the Ahlul Bayt. Let's appreciate the greatness of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. When you recite the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein salam, know whom you are visiting, brothers and sisters. And as we conclude the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein salam, let's recap the ideas that were mentioned in the ziyarah. First of all, the blood of Imam al Hussein shook the entire universe. Now you know how. Now you know what's the relationship between the blood of Abi Abdullah al Hussein and the universe. That's number one. Number two, now you come to realize how big the crime of killing the Imam is. It's not that they just killed a man. It was far beyond that as we have demonstrated. And that's why it becomes necessary as we have established for Imam al-Mahdi ta'ala farajah to avenge the blood of Imam al Hussein. As for us, our obligation is to migrate towards Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Life is this journey, ongoing journey, which we must use it to effectively and actively migrate to Imam al Hussein, as we explained in one of the nights. And finally, know the value of ziyarah, brothers and sisters. For 10 nights, we just shed some light on a one page ziyarah of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Know the value of these ziyarahs in protecting our faith in preserving our values. Next time when you go to Abu Abdullah or you open the ziyarah and speak to Abu Abdullah, contemplate the passages that you are reading. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved our teachings for us. It's the ziyarah of Imam al Hussein salamu alayhi. And now, respected brothers and sisters, let me take your hearts to the land of Karbala on such a night. What was happening in Karbala on such a night? What a difficult night. But on tonight, on such a night, the women, the children, they were very happy to be with their men. The woman had comfort, Abbas was there, Al Qasim was there, Ali Al Akbar was there. On such a night, they had no fear because they were well protected by those men. But on a day like tomorrow, brothers and sisters, what would happen to these women and children? Allahu Akbar, take your heart to the land of Karbala and see what was going on on such a night. On such a night, you had two camps. One camp was busy partying, laughing, getting drunk, committing vices. On the other side, you had a camp engaging in ibadah, praying Salat al-Layl. The historian says they had a buzzing like the buzzing of a bee. You know, as they were murmuring those acts of worship, those du'as, it's as if there was a buzzing of the bee. 
This was the camp of the Imam and his companions. Spending their last night in Ibadah. On this last night, you know, the army of Yazid, they wanted to start the battle in the middle of the night. They wanted to start the war. They did not want to wait till the day of Ashura. Al Imam Al Hussein salam, sends his brother Abbas, he dispatches him. Oh, Abbas, go to those enemies and ask them for one more night. Why, oh, Aba Abdullah, why do, you not, why do you want one more night? Why? Do you want to live longer? Do you want to see your family? Do you want to enjoy this life? What is it? He says, go and ask them for one more night because I want to spend this night in salah. For Allah knows how much I love salah. Your imam asked the enemies to give him an extra night so he can worship Allah, so he can do his salah. Know the value of your salah. You want to honor your imam, honor your salah. He asked for an additional night just because of salah. On such a night, one of the companions of the Imam, by the name of Nafi' ibn Hilal. Nafi' ibn Hilal, he says, we were in the tents. When I realized Imam Hussein was missing, he was nowhere to be found in the tents. He says, I became worried. Where is Abu Abdullah al Hussein? Where is he? Is he out there in the desert? I became concerned. Maybe one of the enemies comes and hurts him. He says, I went in that dark night, in the middle of the night, searching for Imam al Hussein around the tent. Until finally I came, I found the Imam. I saw Aba Abdullah al Hussein sitting on the ground and he was plucking something out from the ground. I told him, My master Hussein, what brings you here in the darkness of this night, here in the desert? What's wrong? What are you doing? What are you plucking down, out from the ground? He told me, oh Nafi', tomorrow when the enemies shall attack the tent and they will burn the tent, the little children and the women will run away from the burning tents and they will be barefoot, they will be running around these tents and there are a lot of thorns here. I am taking and removing these thorns. What a gentle and compassionate heart you have, oh Abba Abdullah. You're spending some time on your last night removing these thorns from the way so that your children do not get hurt. But do you know what they did to your children on the day of Ashura? On such a night, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam goes to his son Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam. He tells him, My dear son Zayn al Abidin, my dear son Ali. I have a request from you, tomorrow when all the men shall be killed, these children will be orphaned, there will be no one to lack, look after them, no one to care for them. I want you to be the one who will care for them. When they cry and shed tears, I want you to wipe their tears, comfort them, they will feel very agonized and traumatized and depressed. I want you to be there and comforting them. He said, yes, oh my father, I will do that. Then Imam al Hussein calls all the women, oh Zainab, oh Umm Kulthum, Oh Sakina, come all of you gather, I want to give you my final will. When they all gather around Al Imam Al Hussein, Imam Al Hussein says, tomorrow after I shall be killed, Ali ibn Al Hussein, my son Ali is your Imam, you follow him. I am appointing him as the Imam after me. And then the Imam alayhi salam makes a request from Al Imam Zayn Al Abidin alayhi salam, and this pertains to us brothers. The Imam Ali Salam Bunaya Ali Balig Shi Ati Salam. My dear son Ali, convey my salam to my Shia. What do you want to say, Oba Abdullah? Tell them, tell my Shia that I was killed thirsty. So remember him thirsty. بلغ شيعت السلام وقل لهم إن أبي قتل عطشانا فذكروه Yes, O Abba Abdullah, we will honor your crest. Whenever we drink water, we will remember your thirst, O Abba Abdullah. The day of Ashura comes. Lady Zainab alayhi speaking of thirst, 
she brings a six month old baby and she hands the baby to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. She tells him, Oh Aba Abdullah, his mother Rabab is no longer able to breastfeed him. There's no water and he's withering. Don't you see in this heat he's withering? Take him to the other side, go approach the enemies. Maybe they'll have some mercy on him and they'll give him water. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he takes that six month old baby. He goes out in that field in the desert. He carries the baby in his arms and he addresses the enemies and he tells them, Oh people, if you have no mercy on me, if you consider me to be sinful, then what is the sin of the six month old baby? Do you not see how he's struggling? How he's dying from thirst? Have some mercy on him. Give him some water. You've killed my other sons you've killed my family you've killed my companions and he's the only one left give him some water there was a commotion in the army of Umar ibn Sa'ad some of them said yes let's give him water some of them said no let's not give him water at that point oh believers Harmala he looks at Umar ibn Sa'ad Omar ibn Sa'ad tells him, Oh Harmala, end this dispute. You know what it, what it, what it takes. You know what, it ha what you have to do. He tells him, Oh Omar ibn Sa'ad, what should I do? He tells him, Do you not see the whiteness of the neck of that baby? Harmala, he takes the arrow. It was a poisonous. It was a three-headed arrow. He takes the arrow and he shoots at that wonderful neck of Ali and al Azgar. Oh, believers, the arrow comes landing on the neck of Ali and it slaughters him. Historians tell us that the baby took its hands from the swaddle, from the cloth. It's as if he wanted to hug his father. It's as if he was saying, Father, is this the water that they gave me? Al Imam Al Hussein takes his hand under the neck of Ali and Al Azgar. He collects the blood, he throws it. He says, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, the only thing that allows me not to collapse is that you're watching this tragedy. The Imam alayhi salam takes his slaughtered son. He places his son under his cloak. Effectively, the Imam alayhi salam was hiding the baby. How is he going to hand him to Zainab? How is he going to hand him to Sakina, to his mother? The Imam alayhi salam approaches the tent, but then the Imam doesn't know what to do. He goes back. He goes again to the tent. He goes back for seven times your imam goes back and forth not knowing what to do when the women they realize about abdullah is by the tents they come out they see the color of the imam had changed they told him oh Abba abdullah what's going on they realize he was hiding something under his cloak they tell him oh hussein what are you hiding under your cloak the Imam alayhi salam takes out the slaughtered baby. He gives it to Zainab. Oh Zainab, take the baby. See what they've done to him. Instead of the water that they gave him, they shot him with an arrow. They took him to his month to his mother Rabab. She broke into tears. Bunaya, Bunaya, Ali. You know, one narration tells us that on the, on the eve of the 11th of Muharram, on Ashura at night, when they gave the women and, some, and the children water to drink, Rabab, she took some water to drink, and then she left the tents. When Zainab was doing a head count, making sure all the orphans and the women are in the tent, she realized Rabab is not there. Zainab salam goes out in that dark night searching for Rabab when she hears a faint voice coming from away and she approaches and she sees Rabab sitting next to the grid, next to the bodies crying Zainab tells her Rabab what brings you out here don't you know it's dangerous come back to the tent Rabab says oh Zainab 
today I did not have any milk to breastfeed my six month. <laughs> and he died thirsty. But when they gave me some water, now I have some milk. <laughs> I'm searching for my baby. I want to give him some milk. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladhina zalamu ala muhammadin ayya munqalabiyan qalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين ورحمة الله وبركاته. Brothers and sisters, raise your hands in du'a with broken hearts and tears. Allah has promised that He would answer our prayer. Everyone who's ill, many brothers have asked me. They know people who are suffering, who are going through illnesses. This is the moment of du'a. Ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to cure them, to give them a speedy recovery. Let's recite this holy verse from the Quran five times so that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala answers our calls. Everyone with one voice, raise your hand. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Amen. Yujibu al Mudhtar Ida Adaa wa Yakshifu Su. Amen. Yujibu al Mudhtar Ida Adaa wa Yakshifu Su. Amen. Amen. يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء. يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة مسموقة بالصلاة على محمد وآل محمد